Hey everybody and welcome to Bits of Board, where we're talking board games, miniatures, cards and dice. My name's Michael and today we are checking out a game by the name of Pax Renaissance. Now this game's been on my list of things to do on this channel for so long and I'm super happy to get it out there because guess what? It's finally got a well-deserved second edition up on Kickstarter right now. And I'll tell you what, it is a well-deserved upgrade for the components and just the look and feel of the game because it's a PAX game and it's got... And it, you'll, you'll see what I mean, you'll get to see the look and the feel in this video. This is the first edition game that we're looking at, but all this is going to carry over to the second edition, which I believe even comes with the game expansion that expands some of the cards that can come out, but... Oh. Anyway, this one is just going to be the how to play, learn the game kind of thing, and it's going to probably whet your appetite for what's ahead. So, without further ado, let's get into it. PAX Renaissance is a PAX game through and through. It's a small box game with huge depth and replayability, and it requires players to digest a huge amount of information before it can hit the table. It's essentially a sandbox game, allowing a player to do pretty much whatever they want with the tools at hand, and how the game progresses is completely up to the players. Nothing in Renaissance is staged. Cards are not tiered and will appear at random, so it's really up to players to evaluate their options and set their own goals accordingly. In Pax Renaissance, players take on the role of bankers, influencing a Renaissance-era Europe. Throughout the game, they will utilise contacts from both the East and West to harness their growing influences in order to achieve victory. On their turn, a player will take two actions. They can purchase a card from either the East or the West market, placing it in their tableau, sell a card, adding florins to their personal supply, perform operations or ops, utilizing the powers in their tableau, set off a trade fair, causing money to be generated and sent across the map, and finally, a player may declare victory. There are four ways to win in Renaissance, however, not all of these conditions will be available over the course of a game, and in fact, it's up to players themselves to decide how and when these game end conditions occur. The specifics for victory we'll cover shortly, but just to know it has to do with the cards a player has collected and placed into their tableau, and in some cases, the current state of the map. Now, the map is surprisingly not actually where the entirety of the game is played. It's just a representation of the world state, and it's the marketplace and the player's tableau where focus should begin. These locations are where a player's strategy, power, and intention all lay, and decoding these are absolutely crucial for playing your best game. But don't worry so much about that for the first few games, that's uh, not a healthy way to get into a PAX game. You should begin by just playing blindly, just to get a feel of what the game can do. For us now though, let's just take a tour of the play area, beginning with the map and the markets. The map we've touched upon, it's just a representation of the world state. The map is divided across 10 cards, separating the 10 different empires in the game. The six cards on the left represent the west, and the four cards on the right represent the east. Detailed across the map are two different trade routes, a route to the east and a route to the west. And between each card exists a border where a token can and will be placed. So leave room. Zooming into a single card, we can see the empire's name, its theocracy, if one is present, the theocracy of the location if the card is ever flipped, and its cities where tokens may be placed. These tokens are knights and rooks representing military power and are collectively known as ruling class tokens. Rooks may also be placed in the sea borders, at which point they become pirates. In these borders, as well as landlocked borders, we can also place players' pawns known as concessions. These represent merchants and the permission to trade with any of the fairs passing through. We also have bishop pieces, however these are not played onto the map, and instead inhabit cards in a player's tableau. The knights, rooks and bishops can be one of three colours, black, red or white, representing forces of religion. Black pieces represent forces of Islam, red pieces are reformists, and white pieces are Catholic. 
Continuing on our tour, around the map we have the East and West Markets, the Empire Stack, and Victory Cards in their inactive state. Market tracks contain all the cards that can be purchased by players over the course of the game. At one end, we have their Trade Fair card, which can hold revenue to be distributed during the Trade Fair action, and at the other end we have the Draw Deck, from which we will be replenishing each market track. There are two types of card that can appear in the market, Tableau Cards and Comet Cards. The first, Tableau Cards, can be purchased and placed into a player's Tableau. They contain a lot of information, but not all of it's imperative for gameplay. As with other PAX games, flavour text helps flesh out the game world, but should be mostly ignored as you first learn to play. The rest though, you will have to learn. Let's take a closer look. In the top left, we have any game pieces or agents to be placed when the card is played into a tableau. In the top right, we have any prestige that the card provides, and these will be counted towards a number of victory conditions. There are six kinds of prestige in total. Three religious prestige, displaying Catholic, Islamic, and reformist prestige, law prestige, discovery prestige, and patron prestige. Generally situated in the middle of the card, in square coloured boxes, we have the card's ops. These may be activated during a player's ops action, and may be reactivated multiple times over the course of a game. Some cards may also display a one-shot action that may be activated once when the card is first played, and some may even have special abilities present on them as well, which work as the ability describes. Finally, we have some information telling the player which empire or location of the map where the card's actions must be utilised. The second type of card is the Comet card. When purchased, these are not placed into a player's tableau, and instead are just discarded. Here, the purchasing player is allowed to choose one of the remaining inactive victory conditions to now become active, flipping the card over. And once active, that kind of victory may be claimed by any player, utilising their victory action. Next to the victory cards, we have the inactive empire cards, which can be claimed by a player through what's called a regime change. Now, there are a number of ways to cause a regime change throughout the game, and we'll detail them as we go through, but for now, we'll just look at the cards. Empire cards have two sides, a king side and a republic side, and when first obtained are always placed in the tableau king side up. King cards behave just the same as tableau cards, providing agents, prestige and ops as normal, and are counted towards the imperial victory condition. Once in play, they can suffer a regime change, and if so, will do one of two things. If the card is owned by an opponent, ownership of the empire card is transferred to the tableau of the player causing the regime change. On the other hand, if the card is already owned by the player making the action, the regime change instead causes the card to be flipped to its Republic side, then counting towards a Renaissance victory instead. Now we'll talk later about how these regime changes can occur, but uh, for now we'll close off the setup tour and begin talking about gameplay. Like I said, Pax Renaissance is a sandbox game, so learning the game is really all about learning how players can influence the world and why they would choose to do so. This brings us first to our in-depth look at the four main victory conditions. But remember, before a victory condition can be claimed, the condition must be first activated by a player purchasing a Comet card. The first kind of victory is that of an Imperial victory. To claim this, a player must have at least two more King cards than any other opponent. This is King cards only and does not include Republic cards. Now, this victory condition changes a little bit in a two-player game, and instead of two more King cards, a player requires three to claim victory. Next is the Renaissance victory. To claim this, a player must have both more Republics than any other player and more Law Prestige than any other player. Next is the Globalization victory. To claim this, a player must have at least two more Pawn Agents than any other player and also have more Discovery Prestige than any other player. And finally, we have the Holy victory, where a player must have more Prestige in the Supreme Religion than any other player. For religion to be the supreme religion, it must have first more bishops in play than all other religions combined, and then more tokens of its colour in theocracies than all other religions combined. 
This one's a little more complicated. Here, we'll look at each location on its theocratic side, then count the number of same coloured pieces matching the religion displayed. Comparing these, we may have our winner. Now, there is a fifth way to win that is more often going to come up during your first few games than experienced games. And this is resolved if both the East and West market decks are ever depleted during a market refresh. This one's simple. The winner is the player with the most patron prestige. Now, I know that's a lot, and we haven't even looked into the specifics of the actions, but trust me, knowing all this stuff here, that's a huge step forward in getting into the game. So let's begin setting up from scratch. We lay our map cards out, beginning with their medieval side face up and their theocratic side face down. This is all except for the Papal States and Mamluk, starting with their Catholic and Islamic sides face up, respectively. Next, we place discs covering potential start locations for our trade routes. With black discs, we cover Timbuktu and Novgorod. And with our white disc, we cover the Spice Islands. This leaves Trebizond and Tana as the start locations for our trade routes. Next, we prepare the market decks. We take 12 cards from the East deck and 12 cards from the West deck and combine them with their decks Comet cards. To the tops of these decks, we now add a further four cards per player, and then deal out the market. Six cards across, turning the leftmost card face down to create the trade fair space. The remaining cards are not used and returned to the box. Finally, we place starting pieces, ruling class tokens as indicated by capitalization of their city's text, and player pawns on their player-specific border. Players will then take their player cards, placing them in front of them, as well as their starting florins. First player takes three, second takes four, and third and fourth players take five and six florins, respectively. Players are now ready to begin the game. Now, there's no hiding it. Pax Renaissance is a complex game, but on the surface, it's kind of easy to get into. As I mentioned earlier, on their turn, a player will take two actions, the market will then be refreshed, replacing any purchased cards, and then play will move clockwise to the next player in turn order. Play will continue until either a victory action is taken or both market decks are emptied. The flow of the game is that simple. It's the details, and those actions where the game's complexity really shines through. There are six actions a player can take on their turn. There's no order required for the actions, and some are allowed to be taken more than once. We'll go ahead and detail them now. First, we have the three actions that can be taken multiple times per turn. Number one is Purchase Market Card, where a player will spend florins from their supply on a card from one of the two marketplaces. Spent florins are placed on the cards prior to it in the track, beginning with the Trade Fair card. That means the first card will cost you one florin, the second card will cost you two, and the third card will cost you three. In this example, we're going to take the first card for one florin. Now, there are some cases where you may need to place a florin on a card already bought. Let's say if I wanted to purchase the second card here. I would begin by placing florins on any cards prior to the space in the track, and then instead of paying the gap, the spent florin is placed on the card in the same position on the other market track. Florins may build up on cards over time, and if you ever purchase a card with florins on it, they go into your supply. There are a couple of restrictions here. You can never buy a card if you already have two cards in hand, and you can never purchase a card if you've already paid a florin to that card. Purchase tableau cards are kept in hand until either played or sold. Comet cards, on the other hand, are taken and discarded immediately. Here the player will choose a victory condition to activate by flipping the associated victory card to its active side. And then play continues. Now, cards not purchased on a player's turn may become cheaper as the game progresses. After each player's turn, the market refresh phase will cause cards to slide down into any vacant positions in the track, and new cards to appear from the associated market deck. Now, it is possible for a trade route card to be discarded over the course of a player's turn. And in this case, the refresh works the same way, except the card sliding down into the trade route will actually be flipped face down 
in the process. Another thing to note is that as we move cards, any florins present on the card move down with it. And like I said, after all cards have been moved down, new cards are drawn from the market deck to fill the gaps. Now, if a market deck is ever depleted during a market refresh, then any remaining positions are filled from the market deck on the opposite side. That is, west market cards will begin to appear in the east, or vice versa. And if both decks are ever depleted, well, it's game over. Moving on to our next action, we have the ability to play cards and place agents. Here a player will place a card from their hand into their tableau according to the part of the world the card relates. If it's placed in the east, the card is placed in the rightmost position in a player's tableau. If it's placed in the west, the leftmost position it goes. The player will then need to decide whether they enact the card's one-shot ability if one is present. If they do, they must place the depicted agent in the location associated with the card, otherwise placement of the agent is optional. If the one-shot is a religious war, conspiracy, or peasant revolt, they place the agents to the side of the card and initiate a battle as per the rules of the one-shot. If the one-shot is a trade shift or a coronation, there is no battle and agents are simply placed. The first type of agent is a pawn. Again, these are placed in one of the borders of the associated empire and represent both merchants and their permission to sell during a trade fair. The second and third are knights and rooks, collectively known as ruling class tokens. If not in battle, these can be placed in a city of the player's choice on the location card depicted. Knights kind of represent attacking power and rooks defense. These pieces will be counted when resolving battles and in resolving a religious victory. It should be noted here that the pieces printed on the card in this case have no bearing on what piece can actually be placed. Now these three agents, pawns, knights and rooks, if a player chooses to place them in an already occupied location, they must pay one florin to replace or repress the token. Pawns may repress other pawns, and ruling class tokens may repress ruling class tokens. And to determine what repress actually means, we check to see if the location's empire card is active and in play. If it is, the removed agent is placed atop their empire card and may be counted when resolving battles in their location. If, however, the empire card is not active and remains in the empire deck, the agent is simply removed to the supply. The two final agents that can be placed are bishops and pirates. Bishops are crucial for achieving a holy victory and are also used to prevent players from activating their ops. This is known as silencing and it occurs when any bishop is present on a tableau card. Because you see, bishops are not placed on the map and instead inhabit the player's tableaus. When placed, they can be situated directly on the card played or any card sharing its location. Now, if any bishop is already present on the card, instead of being placed, both bishops are killed and returned to the supply. This is called the Diet of Worms rule. Otherwise, we check for any repressed tokens on the card's associated empire. And if there are any present, the player may choose to kill one, returning the piece to the supply. This is called pacification. Finally, we have pirates, and these are represented by rooks placed in one of the sea borders. These are specific borders located between empires containing active or inactive trade routes. Pirates kill any pieces already present in the area they are placed. Now, first up you'll notice two terms used for removing agents from the map. These are repress and kill. Remember? Repressed agents will resolve based on whether their empire is in play, and for killed agents, we simply remove them to the supply. Now, secondly, we've glossed over some stuff there, those one-shots. Resolution of these can be better understood after you've got a bit more of a handle on some of the gameplay, so we'll cover them after we've finished the actions. Speaking of which, we'll move right on to our third action, 
sell cards. A player here simply discards a single card from their hand or tableau and gains two florins in the process. The discarded card is removed with any queens, vassals or tokens on it removed as well. Now before moving on, just a quick reminder, those previous actions, the buy, play and sell actions may be performed multiple times per turn. These remaining actions may only be taken once. First up here, we have the Perform Ops action. Here a player will activate a group of cards in their tableau, either those in the east or west side of their player card. Here a player will activate one op per card in the side activated. Now when taking an ops action, players should be aware of any bishops that are placed on cards in their activated region, because bishops silence any ops they are on. This means a player will be unable to activate any ops unless they are religious ops. Now there are four categories of ops, religious, economic, political, and military. For our religious ops, the blue ops, we have only one. The Inquisitor op allows players to move a single bishop in the colour indicate. The chosen bishop may move to either an adjacent tableau card or any card so long as the bishop's destination matches the location of where they started. The only restriction here is that a bishop cannot move onto or across a player card, meaning they cannot move between cards of the east and west. With movement, just as for their initial placement, players should resolve any diet of worms or pacification rules as required. For economic ops, again we have only one, the commerce op. The commerce op simply allows players to take a florin from a card in the market indicated. For political ops, we have four, behead, tax, repress and vote. Behead allows the player to discard a card in any tableau that shares the activated card's location. If the action is used to discard an Empire card, the activated card itself is discarded in the process. Tax allows the player to target a pawn bordering the activated card's location. The pawn will be removed to their owner's supply unless the owner plays a florin to the bank. The only restriction here is that the op cannot be utilised if all city spaces on the location contain ruling class tokens. Repress allows the player to repress the indicated token from the associated location. This gains the activating player a florin in the process. Finally, Vote allows a player to cause a regime change against any active empire in the east or west as indicated by the card. This action is only possible if the activating player has more pawns in the empire's borders, with a cost being associated equal to florins in the number of repressed tokens present on the empire. Remember, if the empire card belongs to another player, it moves to your own tableau, and if it's already yours, the card is flipped to its opposite side. Finally, we have our three military ops, Corsair, Siege, and Campaign. Corsair allows the player to move a pirate in the colour indicated between borders of the activating card's location. Just as in their initial placement, the pirate will destroy any pawns or different coloured pirates in its destination, but in this case cannot be moved to a location containing a light coloured pirate. Siege allows players to kill a ruling class piece or pirate located in the card's location. And finally, the Campaign Op, only present on the King's side of the Empire card, allows players to attack from the card's location, battling one of its neighbouring cards, that is Empires, orthogonally or diagonally adjacent. We'll cover this in more detail when we talk about the other battles, those initiated through the one-shot abilities, but for the moment just know that if the attack is successful, the defending Empire suffers a regime change, and the card is placed under the attacking king king as a vassal, and these vassals count as kings towards an imperial victory. The final action we've not covered is the Perform Trade Fair action, which distributes any florins collected on one of the trade fair cards along its associated trade route. To complete the action, a player first chooses which market to utilise and we go from there. 
The first stage is profits, where additional florins are added to the trade fair card. We get one additional florin at two player and two at any high account. The new total are the profits and will be distributed throughout the rest of the trade fair action. Before that begins though, the active player should discard the trade fair card so that it will be replaced in the next market refresh. The second stage is Voyage, whereby the activating player will trace a voyage from the trade route's start location along towards its end. Over the course of the voyage, the activating player will do two things, disperse voyage profits and build levies. First up, they will take one florin from the profits for themselves. As they trace the voyage from one map card to the next, the activating player will disperse profits if they ever trace across an empire border containing either a pawn agent or a pirate. If the piece is a pawn, they will distribute one florin to the pawn's owner. And if it's a pirate, they will return a florin to the supply. Should the profits ever be exhausted, the trade fair is over and does not proceed to the next card en route. Now, thematically, the distribution of wealth across a trade fair attracts bandits, and some cities respond by generating levies or hiring armies to protect themselves. To reflect this, each card that the trade fair crosses will gain one ruling class token if a space is available to place them. This includes the card where the trade fair began. In resolving this, the activating player will choose one vacant city on the card and place an agent of the type and colour represented by the city. Once complete, the trade continues and we go on until all profits are distributed or the fair reaches its end. In this case, any remaining florins are returned to the trade fair space and placed atop the replacement card during the market refresh. Now there is a sixth action we've already looked at, and this is the victory action where a player announces that they hold the requirements to claim one of the active victory conditions. These are again, the imperial victory where players want kings, the renaissance victory where players want republics, the globalization victory where players want pawns on the map and discovery prestige in their tableau, and the holy victory where the player wants supreme religious prestige. Now, we're not quite done yet, but hopefully those victory conditions make a little more sense now than they did at the beginning of the explanation. With that said, we move on to our final section, and it's here that we're going to go through the one-shot powers and battles in general. The first one-shot we'll look at is the Trade Shift. These change the start location of their associated trade fair. To complete this one-shot, a player first must have Discovery Prestige already present, and then we simply move the disc covering the new start location and place it covering the old. So in this case, we're going to be moving the white disc from Spice Islands, placing it on Trebizond. This will change the trade route that the associated trade fair will move along. Next, we have coronations, which are present on Queens. When played, the one shot enacts a regime change against one of the empires indicated. Here, we'll place the Queen card behind the King card in a cruciform orientation, they called it. This keeps the Queen's prestige and any available ops visible for further play. Queens can still be placed without their one-shots, however, they forego their ops and abilities, and only their prestige is observed. Next, we have the War one-shots, and these come in two types, Civil Wars and Religious Wars. We'll go over the general points for each first, and then we'll look in depth at how these events are actually resolved. For Civil Wars, we have Conspiracies and Peasant Revolts. Both of these one-shots work about the same, with a battle taking place, and if the active player is victorious, they force a regime change in the battle's location. The only differences are which units are considered attackers and defenders in resolving the battle, and that Conspiracies are the only way to restore a location from its theocratic side back to its medieval side. This is something we'll cover right now in Religious Wars. For Religious Wars, we have Jihads, Crusades, and Reformation. These are all resolved in exactly the same way, it's just each one relates to a different religious side. The only restriction with enacting a religious war one-shot is that there must be ruling class tokens of a different colour in the card's location. If enacted, a battle is resolved and depending on the victor, the map card will be flipped to its theocratic side. 
A victorious crusade flips a card if its theocratic side is Catholic. A victorious reformation flips a card if its theocratic side is reformist. Finally, a successful jihad will flip a card if its opposite theocratic side is Islamic. Either way though, whether a card is flipped or not, a victorious religious war will always cause a regime change. Now up to this point we have four different kinds of battle that can take place. We had the campaign op, and now we have the civil wars and the religious wars. The way these are resolved is slightly different for each one, but the general gist remains the same. Each attacking piece kills a defending piece, but is itself killed in exchange. The active player chooses all casualties, and if the attacking force have at least one survivor, the active player is victorious and the regime change occurs. Attackers and defenders for each type of attack are as follows. For a campaign op, attackers are knights present in the originating card's location only, and the activating player must pay a cost equal to one florin for each one present. Defenders are the ruling class tokens in the location to be attacked. And as mentioned before, if the attack is successful, the empire card is taken as a vassal of the attacking king. In a conspiracy, attackers are ruling class tokens present on the card being played, all bordering pirates, and repressed ruling class tokens on the location's empire card. Defenders, as with campaign ops, are ruling class tokens already present on the card. Here, if the attack is victorious, the card can be flipped back to its medieval side. In a peasant revolt, attackers are ruling class tokens or pawns present on the card being played, all bordering pirates and pawns, and also any pawns repressed on the Empire card. Defenders, as usual, are all ruling class tokens already present on the card. On victory, the activating player may choose to return any repressed pawns back into that location's borders if space is available. Finally, in Religious Wars, attackers are all ruling class tokens present on the played card. In this case, we have just a bishop, so it doesn't take part. Then we get to include all ruling class tokens on the map card of the same colour, knights in any adjacent map tiles of the same colour, and finally any pirates stationed in that location's border of the same colour. These attackers in one colour are collectively known as believers. Defenders are any ruling class tokens or pirates that do not share the same location's colour. These are known as heretics. Remember, a religious war can only be enacted if there are heretics to be fought against. On victory, as you saw before, if the map card's theocratic side is of the believer's theocracy, the map tile is flipped. Now it's pretty important to note, but pieces are never actually moved on the map over the course of a battle. However, any agents placed as a result of playing a card will need to find a home after the battle is resolved. That is, they should be placed in a city space if one is available or they will be repressed. Now, there is a little extra reward for these repressed pieces that actually took part in a battle, and they are as follows. Repressed pawns may be relocated to a location's border if room is available to them, and for any of the one-shot battles, that is, civil wars or religious wars, repressed ruling class tokens used to attack may be moved back to the cities of the attacked location, again only if there is room for them. Good news for all though, on the back of the rulebook we have a player aid that helps handle each of the four different types of battle, giving us an at a glance look at everything we need to consider. And there it is guys and gals, players will take turns at taking actions, shaping the world to fit their needs. Whether it's money, power, shaping the religious influences of the lands bound, players do what they want until eventually victory is taken. Now I'm going to let all that sink in for a second, I'm actually going to start doing these as a two-parter. Um, this video has been the teach and the next one will be the review because I think I want to start splitting these up. Some people want to learn, some people want to know if the game's any good or at least what I think about it, um, and not all the times so these things cross over. Yeah. So that said, I am out for the time being. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I hope this has helped you get uh, a better grip on the game. Pax Renaissance is certainly a doozy and I'm sure I don't even have a total grip on it yet, but it is worth playing and anything I can do to help you get there is a good thing done indeed. Um, so make sure you like, comment, subscribe, do all the things that you guys can do to help this channel grow, but 
besides that, we are done. As always, my name's Michael. This is Bits of Board. We'll catch you next time.